Hello readers, how are you this evening? Um, this is portion four, he appeared this week four, and uh, the date is Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. If you're new, you're more than welcome to join us on the journey this fall as we explore God's library line upon line, precept upon precept, as revealed in his library of 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Daily we read portions from the entire Holy Scriptures, this is how the reading program works out. It may sound a bit complicated, but it's not. It only takes 20 minutes a day if you just read straight through. The scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, are composed of 39 books widely known as the Old Testament. The first five books of the scriptures are known in Hebrew as the Torah, the Law, or in Greek as in the Pentateuch, the five scrolls. Each day we begin by reading a portion from the Torah called a Parsha as a section of a biblical book. It's a religious reading custom uh, dating back to the 6th century BC and was established during the Babylonian captivity. In this way, everyone would be reading the same passages throughout the year and would be able to discuss what they read on a daily basis. In one year, we will carefully read through the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then we'll uh, also read an assigned portion from the 13 books of the prophets and historic books, and we'll read um, uh, from a grouping known as the Four Hymns and Precepts of Wisdom Literature, a Psalm of the Day, a Psalm, and a Proverb. Now we go through the Proverbs quite um, slow, so it's only about three, two or three verses, and that way you're able to meditate on those verses, and that's, I, I think that's really helpful. I mean, some people read, you know, you know the Psalm of uh, Proverb one all the way through, and then Psalm 2, all the way through 30. But this is this is more systematic, and we'll be discussing those. And then, and then we'll read a chapter a day from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. And finally, we will read one prophecy from the Old Testament, the Scriptures and the Fulfillment of the New Testament. And then every Tuesday evening, like we'll, right now, we'll review our readings and provide commentary drawn from various suggested resources. Now tonight we're going to have some special uh, special things which I think you'll find interesting and maybe even um, uh, challenging for you. Um, but we'll begin with a devotional uh, from Valley Vision from God Enjoyed. It's page 11. So we're going to read that. And that's from a collection of Puritan Prayers and Devotions, which is really helpful. And um, <clears throat> we also... Uh, we. We post this here, but we also post it back onto our Exploring God's Library Facebook page. It's a private page, and uh, uh, you can join it very easily. And uh, there we have a ton of resources that will come up and that are complementary to your reading every day. So I think you don't want to miss that. All right? And there'll be also a listing of all the books uh, that we, we covered tonight for your, for your, your edification. Okay, we're going to read uh, God and Job. We're going to pray through it. So please bow with me in prayer. Thou incomprehensible, but prayer hearing God, known but beyond knowledge, revealed but unrevealed, my wants and welfare draw me to thee. For thou hast never said, Seek ye me in vain. To thee I come in my difficulties, necessities, distresses, Possess me with thyself, with the spirit of grace and supplication, with a prayerful attitude of mind, with access into warmth of fellowship, so that in the ordinary concerns of life, our thoughts and desires may rise to you. And in habitual devotion, we may find a resource that will soothe our sorrows, sanctify our successes, and qualify us in all our ways for dealing with our fellow men. We bless thee that you have made us capable of knowing you, the author of all being, of resembling you, the perfection of all excellence, of enjoying you, the source of all happiness. O oh God, attend us in every part of our arduous and trying pilgrimage in life. We need the same counsel, defense, comfort we found at our beginning, lest our religion let our religion be more obvious to our conscience and more perceptible to those around. While Jesus is representing us in heaven, may we reflect him on earth. 
While he pleads our cause, may we show forth his praise. Continue the gentleness of your goodness towards us. And whether we wake or sleep, let your presence go with us. Your blessing attend us. Thou hast led us on, and I have, we have found your promises are true. We have been sorrowful, but you have been our help. Fearful, but you have delivered us. Despairing, but you have lifted us up. Your, thy vows are ever upon us, and we praise you, O God. Thank you. And we pray that you would help us through this territory tonight, much territory to cover, um, and uh, give, give me unction and the words to speak, and open our ears and our eyes and our heart and our mind to what you, Holy Spirit, are saying to us in the covenant community. This, um, this may be a, a I, it was a very great lesson for me this week, Lord, as you've led me through many, many things and many trials too. And Lord, we know that you are with us and you guide us. And we pray for Israel. We pray for the situation in Israel that uh, only you can, you can solve, Lord. We pray for um, all those that are in battle. Uh, we pray for those that are innocents in the line of battle, that they escape, they be preserved. We pray for uh, peace. And uh, we know that one day there will be peace in the Middle East. And that is when you, the Prince of Peace, return. So, Lord, until then, we ask you for better minds to guide things and to give them wisdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Well, that's uh, op often a preoccupation for a lot of us these days to keep in track of what's going on in the Middle East, especially in Israel. And, um, and in this, this age, which is very difficult. Um, and what I'd like to do is, you know, we're told quite clearly in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13, and in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, um, that the most definitive statement from the New Testament on how the Old Testament is to be used and what roles it must play in the life of believers is that all Scripture is God-breathed. Pasographe theopenosis, and is profitable for teaching, reproof, training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that this means the entire Old Testament, and urges the church to go to the Old Testament to get her doctrine and her teaching material. And that was in the, um, in the days before the New Testament came. And of course we have now the New Testament and Old Testament. At the same time, Paul in 2 Timothy uh, 2, 2, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 2, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions as I delivered them to you. Follow the tradition of the apostles and apostles' doctrine, Today we have the entire corpus, so we hold clearly to them. This week's Torah portion is, And He Appeared. As we cover Genesis 18 through 30, 22, um, and more fully get a picture of God's relationship to Abraham and Sarah, during this portion we will examine the marker term Christophany as well. John Davis, is the commentary we're using, is Paradise to Prison. It's excellent. Uh, sets the sage uh, for us, of what may have it, it may it, it what it may have been like to approach Abraham's tent from his own personal travels. Quote: As we approached the crest of the hill in the 110 degree heat, we saw the most welcome sight of the afternoon: the little black tent of our Bedouin friend Mohammed Radin. That he would warmly welcome us was beyond question. More than once we have been the benefactors of the warm hospitality of the Tamari Bedouin who roam these hills. After the usual introduction and greetings, we were invited into the large section of the tent where other men were seated on a large, ornate rug. We joined them and enjoyed hot tea prepared in typical Bedouin fashion, 
On the other side of the partition, the ladies talked excitedly as they prepared a meal. Now, we're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 18, verse 18. So if you have a Bible. Then the Lord appeared to him at the, at the terebinth tree, trees of Mamre, <coughs> as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread, then you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. I recognize hospitality in the desert is very, very, very key. It's a very important important part of their life. I've even heard that the Bedouins uh, control the territory around uh, the desert, uh, around Egypt, and you can't not get to Egypt or buy those things without going through the Bedouin. They are absolute rulers uh, in their area. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. John Davis explains that Abraham had that day, uh, um, explains that Abraham had that day, uh, he'd been resting in the shadow of the oaks in Hebron on a hot day when the three men approached the tent. It seems that he recognized one of the three men was God himself. While Abraham bowed to his visitors, it was a normal custom of humility to visitors. When he addressed one of the visitors as my Lord and said, I, if now I have found favor, was often used when talking to someone of higher rank or when honoring someone. Abraham's use of it furnishes no evidence that he recognized one of the visitors to be a theophany or Christophany. Here Abraham exhibits fine, the fine exam, example of oriental hospitality. Then he said to them, Where is Sarah your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. The fact that they knew Sarah's name indicated they were not mere men, and the purpose of their visit had to do with her. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to, you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening uh, in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now, uh, what are, who is Sarah? Uh, David Zucker, a rabbi, wrote Sarah the View of the Classical Rabbis. Uh, and and he was writing this in Perspectives on Our Father Abraham Essays in honor of Marvin R. R. Wilson, professor at Gordon College, who wrote Our Father Abraham, Jewish Roots of the Christian Faith. And um, uh, here he paints a portrait of Sarah. Sarah is the Bible's first matriarch, mother of the Jewish people. She is born Sarai, the name she holds for more than half her life. She is barren. In midlife, along with her husband, Abraham, she leaves home and travels at God's invitation to a new and as yet undisclosed land. Go from your country and kindred to the land which I will show you. Abraham's father, Terah, leads the way with Abraham and Sarai and Abraham's nephew, Lot. Sarah is the subject of many classical Jewish texts and collections of Midrash. Midrash, her sermon is based upon biblical texts and interpretations of what are by nature limited words devoted to Sarah. But if people knew her personally, they would be much more extensive. Sarah, at age 65, is still an extraordinarily beautiful woman. Her husband attests to this when he says to her, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, Genesis 12, 11. Just how beautiful is she? The rabbis provide several answers. Eve was a beautiful woman. She transmitted her beauty to the reigning beauties of each generation. Yet Sarah was even more beautiful than Eve. Four women were surprisingly, surpassingly beautiful, 
And Sarah was one of the other three women. Rahab, the prostitute mentioned in Joshua 2.1. Abigail, one of King David's wives. 1 Samuel 25.3. And Queen Esther in Esther 2.15. Sarah's journey from Canaan to Egypt was long and arduous, but Sarah maintained her beauty. It was here that her husband Abraham faced a dilemma. He says to Sarah, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is, your, this is your wife. This is his wife. Then they will kill me and let you live. Say you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that my life will be spared on your account. Genesis 12, 11 to 13. It's a half truth, a little white lie. Sarah apparently does not seek to dissuade Abraham from his course of action. She was there because she trusted God's promise to Abraham. She believed that no harm would come to the righteous. Other commentators say that Abraham committed a serious sin when he endangered Sarah's honor. Scripture does not record that Sarah agreed to this deception. Some rabbis teach that her chaste behavior set an example for future generations. When Sarah went down to Egypt, she took pains to hedge herself in against unchaste conduct of any kind. Thereafter, all Israelite women, inspired by her example, also took pains to hedge themselves against any unchaste conduct of any kind. So, back to the visitation in chapter 18. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why does Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. He, being the angel of the Lord, appeared in a, a theophany, or some say a Christophany. He knew what was in her heart. Now, what is a Christophany? A Christophany is defined as an appearance or non-physical manifestation of Christ. This was to be a pre-incarnate, uh, pre-incarnate uh, manifestation of Christ. Traditionally, the term refers to visions of Christ after his ascension, such as the bright light which knocked Saul off his horse on the road to Damascus as he was hunting down Christians. And I heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. In Acts 9, 4-5, through 5, and the subsequent one of Ananias, another New Testament example is John's vision of the Son of Man, recounted in Revelation 1, 12 through 18. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of God, or Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as wool, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a, two, went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and last. I am he who lives and who was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. The early church father, Justin Martyr, identified the angel Lord with the, with the Logos. Genesis 3.8 was regarded by most church fathers and medieval commentators as an appearance by the Logos, or pre-existent Christ. And in art, God was always given the features of Jesus until about 1400. James D. Lashley <coughs> further elaborates on the appearance of the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1, 1, standard, uh, English Standard Version. He begins with the New Testament to point backward to Christ's deity. He was present at the creation of the world. Even so, Genesis one twenty six makes contribution to this point. We find the plural, let us, a reference to the Trinity, of which the word Christ is a member. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. In such we see that Christ was was the creating force of all things in being the Word. St. Romanos, a notable Syrian-Greek hymnographer 
who lived during the sixth century, interpreted the figure with whom Abraham spoke in Genesis 18, 1 through 8, as being Christ himself. J. Douglas Macmillan suggests that that angel with whom Jacob wrestles as a pre-incarnation appearance of Christ in the form of a man. Such church fathers, such as Origen and later theologians, such as Martin Luther, believed another example is the man who appears to be Joshua, who appears to Joshua, who identifies himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. This standard argument was that, in fact, Christ is, um, in fact, Christ is that he accepted Joshua's prostrate worship, whereas angels refused such worship. See Revelation 19, 9 through 10. Additionally, he declared the ground to be holy elsewhere in the Bible. Only things or places set aside for God or claimed by him are called holy in Exodus 3, 5. Jonathan Edwards, America's great theologian, identified an example in Daniel 3.25 when the fourth man in the furnace is described as, quote, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God or like a son of the gods. The suffering servant from the book of Isaiah is believed by many Christians to be Jesus. The vision of Isaiah 6 may be regarded as a Christophany. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. It appears to have been seen uh, as such by John the Evangelist, who, following a quote from his chapter, adds, Isaiah said this because he knew, saw the glory and spoke of him in John twelve forty one. Well, that's um, uh, quite quite a number of um, uh, passages. And... Um, There's, there's other instances of this angel, of the Lord making appearances, include Gideon. We've been reading uh, Judges. You've been reading Judges. You, you read about Gideon. And uh, you also read about Deborah and Jael and uh, Barak. Um, and then Gideon called by the angel of the Lord in Judges 6, 11 through 23. And the angel of the Lord appearing to Manoah and his wife to inform and instruct them regarding Samson. We're going to talk about Samson tonight. One note regarding the aforementioned scene, aforementioned scene, after having made a sacrifice and witnessing the angel ascend up in the smoke, Manoah and his wife became very afraid that they would die. Um, but, of course, they said he wouldn't have made this announcement to us or accepted our sacrifice. So um, the same resulting from having seen God in Judges. The angel also appears to Elijah in the wilderness. While well, Elijah was in low spirits after hearing of Jezebel's threat against him, in Second in in First Kings nineteen five through seven, the angel appears as well in a night vision to Zechariah, Zechariah one twelve. John MacArthur makes an interesting observation in regards to the angel, this angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord who does not appear after the birth of Christ, is often identified as the pre-incarnate Christ. Further appearances of the Lord include the coming to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre just before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're we're reading all, all about these things: Sodom, and Gomorrah, you know, the angels, you know, two angels coming there, and the Lord wrestling with Jacob, and Jacob in turn being renamed Israel in Genesis thirty-two twenty-four through twenty-nine. Moses being called to deliver Israel out of Egypt from the burning bush in Exodus three fourteen, the pillar of cloud and the fire that went before the children of Israel to lead them. Exodus thirteen twenty one, E. W. Hingens, Hingstenberg made the following comment regarding the revealed God, the Son or Logos, quote, and even at the creation itself, filled up with immeasurable distance between the Creator and the creation, who has been the mediator in all of God's relations to the world. Christ was there, as we can see. Christ was there well before uh, Matthew one one. John Davis, when looking at Abraham's encounter with the three visitors and Abraham's tender and sensitive fellowship, contrasts it with God's awesome judgment and violent destruction of wicked Sodom. Here he provides insight into God's character and his active involvement in the affairs of men. Unlike the 
Jain concept. It's another religion, world religion from India. The Jain concept of God who sets everything in motion but becomes merely an observer of man. God demonstrates his intimate involvement in the fulfillment of his promised plan. At the very same time, he came down as a Jewish writer speak according to the language of men. So eyes, ears, hands, and other members of the body are attributed to God for effecting those things which men cannot accomplish without these members. Well, so that gives you a little bit of a, a picture of that. Well, <clears throat> we're now going to be looking at... Um, Okay, let me get to my I have several pieces of paper here I'm working through. So you have to patience with me. Uh, in Genesis Volume 2 by Alders, um, God reveals to Abraham that Sodom and Gomorrah to be destroyed for their grave sins. Abraham pleads for the lives of any righteous people living there. Now you recognize that God is actually saying, should I go down? Should I actually talk to, to Abraham about this destruction? And so Abraham is quite a negotiator. Um, and uh, he's negotiating, a, 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 would you um, spare the city if you know, 50 righteous people can be found. He eventually agrees to spare them if 10 righteous people uh, can be found. Two angels appearing as men are sent to Sodom in, and, but are met with a wicked mob. And it's a really a wicked mob. And um, they see the two angels and they're very, you know, they're glorious beings. And um, they want to have intimate relationships with them. And the angels are saying that, well, to... to to Lot, which is Abraham's um, his brother? Nephew. No, nephew. Nephew, right. Abraham's nephew. Um, the angels are saying, we'll just stay in the, uh, the, the plaza. I mean, they could defend themselves for sure. But um, Lot said, no, that's not a hospitable thing. Come into my house. And so you, you're probably reading about that. It's really, it's, it's a really, uh, these angels are met with a very wicked mob that want to have, um, they want to have sex with the angels, and they want to know them, int know them, and that's that's a nice way of saying having sex with them. And so, um, and Lot is now this is kind of a strange thing. I don't really understand this. It's still kind of something I kind of you know when you're reading through scripture, R.C. Sproul once said that. You're going to come across things where you go, I don't understand this. So you write questions in, you know, in your, your, um, your margins. Um, why did Lot offer his two daughters <coughs> to this mob of wicked men to have sex with? I mean, you would want to be protective of your daughter. And, um, of course, you know, the mob um, was just outraged and... You know, and they, the angels basically they they protected protected uh, Lot and the family, and um, and when they they came to the door, they wanted to break in. They were vicious, but uh, the angels um, struck them, and they were blind. They went blind, and they couldn't find their way out. Um, so, um, the angels found only Lot and his family is righteous among the inhabitants and so you know, didn't didn't come to the 50 or the 10 and um, and so the angels warned Lot to uh, quickly evacuate the city because it had just become too wicked and as they flee destruction Lot's wife he was told she was told don't look back you know and uh, it's one great scripture in in the New Testament is that forgetting what lies behind and pressing on towards what lies ahead Sometimes we need to forget the past, not forget it, the lessons, but forget all the hurts and everything. Go forward, you know, dealing with these things, but and, and processing them. But we need to not. I mean, when when God calls us to set our hands to the plow, we need to keep working. Now, um, so that's a that's a great 
It's a great, um, a great study, by the way. Um, I'm now going to go to look at uh, Samson in Judges chapter 10 to 21. We, we looked at, we we're going to only look at three, because we're reading through the scriptures. This is not exactly a study, Bible study, but we're attempting to cover these significant characters so you understand them, so you can always go back to them. But um, we're looking at, because we've, when we're reading through uh, Judges, we're reading about Jephthah, we're reading about uh, Micah, we're reading about all sorts of different uh, judges. Now, these are not judges like you know, court judges. They're often, often they're military people that are strategists or they're endowed with certain kinds of abilities to actually conquer the enemies that were trying to conquer Israel. It was a time when, when uh, you know, the people were all doing their own thing. And uh, and they were under bondage of a lot of um, a lot of the the people the tribes in the land, kind of like today, right? And so, if we were to do a leadership study on the life of Samson, would you say he finished well? It's a good question, right? Samson is the sixth major judge and the twelfth and last of the total group presented in the book of Judges. For all that is said about Samson, however, he is one of the most difficult of the judges to understand and evaluate. He has certain glaring <coughs> weaknesses of character, which are made prominent in the sacred record. And and the reader tends to think of him in a poor light, often. I mean, it's almost like a soap opera sometimes. Uh, it's, you know, Samson delight of these things. It's easy to regard him more as a person from whom to learn negatively than positively more how not to live than how to live. One should be careful, however, of judging him too harshly and letting these weaknesses cloud the strong points he had. And he did have these as well as can be seen. Um, And in leadership theory, there's something called negative processing. If you've gone through negative experiences, often you learn more from your negative experiences than you do your positive. So if you're doing a leadership study of, of Samson, you might look at a lot of things that you should not do as a leader. And we'll go into those a little bit. Samson was endowed by God with supernatural strength, which also required humility, as his gift is only to be used for the glory of God. And by the way, this is from, uh, this is from um, Leon Wood on distressing days of the judges. I'm reading from his thing. As you know, this is a reading course, so a lot of this is just some of these are my words, but some of them are you know, just right from the right from the source of these people who have actually studied for a long time, um, studied these these uh, these passages. So Samson was endowed by God with supernatural strength, which also required humility, as his gift is only to be used for the glory of God. It is actually a lesson for those in leadership, who are especially gifted by God, not to fall into sin. Many leaders don't finish well and lose that anointing which God gives them to minister. Be ye holy as I am holy. Samson had to remind himself of his gifting. Of course, his strength and vows as a Nazarite made him attractive to women. Now, um, I did post on EGL uh, an excellent sermon by, it was read, of, uh, of... of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. On, on this very fact about men that lose their anointing. And I think we can look at that in the modern church, too, um, of all the uh, you know, men that actually fall to sexual sin. It's a big problem. Sexual sin and uh, financial sin are two of the big ones. You know, we have to, um, to, to finish well, you've got to really watch yourself. Leon Woods comments, The first time Sam- Samson was to use his strength as recorded in the text, would be at his marriage to a Philistine girl when he may have been about 20 years old. He had become infatuated with the girl and asked his parents to arrange a wedding. He kind of demanded them to arrange the wedding. They properly objected because the girl was not an Israelite. She wasn't a member of the local church, let's put it that way. However, it was more than a wedding, as it was divinely intended to provide an occasion against the Philistines. See, the Philistines have been, been just harassing the Israelites. And um, as, as the Israelites were, 
were uh, disobedient, and God allowed the, these local uh, local tribes to be uh, kind of a thorn in their side. It's important to notice that when Samson first felt his special enablement of the strength uh, would have been a moment long to remember and imagine. He would have changed from being only normally strong to being miraculously strong. When I was a kid growing up in Montana, some of our lazy summer afternoons on Flathead Lake at our, our, friend, uh, our friends, the Moody's uh, A-frame, we would curl up in a pile, uh, up to a pile of comics. My favorite was the Hulk. I now wonder if the Hulk was patterned after, or act, the Hulk was patterned after, uh, after Samson, because that strength came onto him. But it, unlike uh, unlike the Hulk, uh, Samson, when he had the strength, it didn't leave him, except when he was disobedient. There would have been, there would have been the temptation for for instance, to show off his new ability in a display of pride. Imagine if you had such a supernatural ability. There may have been grudges which he had with certain people, and it would have been a temptation now to settle these definitely in his own favor. Obviously, God knew Samson's character and also those, he, uh, those who he would confront. This is the nature of leadership as well. What does one do when he has power? This is most instructive. I mean, seriously, it's something to think about because... It's just not physical strength sometimes. And God may give you, um, you know, other, other attributes that give you power. Um, you know, running a company or you know, making wealth, etc. But what do you do when you have power? Sometimes Samson has been criticized for not raising an army or going against the Philistines directly. But this clearly was not God's intention. News of the fact that he had killed a lion with his bare hands would have spread widely among the Philistines and impressed them. The circumstances surrounding Samson's wedding and the challenge of the riddle about the lion and the honey led to a humiliating contest um, when the Philistine attendees threatened Samson's young bride with death, unless she provided the answer. Although she broke confidence and revealed the secret, they eventually killed family and burned her, family and burned her house. This led to a mass slaughter of those who perpetuated the offense and was humiliating to the Philistines. The outstanding weakness of character in Samson's life, as revealed especially in his later relationship, uh, or the weakness of character in Samson's life, as revealed especially in his latter relationship with Delilah, pertained to lust and passion. Wow, that's something that uh, is going on in, in, in uh, church organizations and, and probably corporations too, but churches especially, um, and especially prevalent. Uh, Samson surely should have sought his, this, his occasion to prov provoke the Philistines in some other manner, which God certainly would have cho shown him had he been willing. Remember, he was called to do this and, um, and to deal with the Philistines, but he didn't, didn't ask. We may find that some of our prayers remain unanswered, and the best thing we can do is wait upon him, as we spoke of in uh, we we will be speaking of in Psalm 22 when we talk about it today. That God employed the wedding event as an occasion by which to provoke the Philistines then was, in spite of Samson's wrong, not because of it. This is in no way this in no way excused Samson for contracting the marriage. Samson breaks his Nazarite vow. You know he couldn't drink wine uh, or fermented drinks, or he couldn't have vinegar or anything like that. Couldn't have um, any intoxicating beverages. But he, and you couldn't go near a dead body. But drawing near the dead lion with the honeycomb, engaging the wedding feast, which would have involved drinking intoxicating beverages, and also he was not to drink for a minute drink. When he fell asleep, as did Sisera. Remember, he fell asleep with, um, with uh, had his head in, in um, the lightless lap. And, and it's much like uh, when Sisera fell asleep in, in Jael's tent. Uh, she was given, uh, she gave him some kefir. Uh, it's a, it's a, a fermented milk, uh, which if you ever uh, drank it, it puts you sound asleep. I mean, it's amazing. Kefir grains were highly prized in Russia, by the way, and given as a gift to ambassadors for use in their country since they were greatly beneficial to healing. A lot of people couldn't get doctors, but the, the kefir was uh, very good for the, 
the, um, the stomach. Or in Jael's case, putting your enemy to sleep is what happened. Now, Samson's unlearned lesson. If the 30 companions had been, been true men, they would have admitted their defeat and paid their debt. They didn't. If the bride had been a true wife, she would have shared the threat of the 30 with Samson. Said, you know, these people are threatening. And then done all possible to protect herself and her father's house. Samson did not profit from his experience, and he acted more naively years later with wicked and manipulative Delilah, who was just a prostitute. The attitude of his countrymen was highly unappreciative for his valiant acts against their enemy. Leon Wood comments, This despicable conduct by the Israelites was their great fear of the enemy. They had come to accept their plight and believe there was nothing that could be done to change matters, so they submitted to the powers that be. In this, they were like many Christians today, Woods, Wood, Woods comments, who also take the, the attitude that there really is nothing that can be done to counter the program of Satan in this world. It is then assumed that the best course is to adjust one's life to this fact and not become overly concerned. However, what does it say? That we're to seek the welfare of the, the community we've been called to in exile. And by seeking its welfare, we will have welfare. And for leaders to actually finish well, they need to think about their own community. They need to act in their community. So why then did the Israelites not rally behind him? This rings true in many life situations. So I want to ask, is there something that you know you should act on and are not doing? So what can you do to rectify that? It's something you might think about. Um, I'm going to also look right now just at some of the lessons, and this is in a very helpful book, and I used this before. It's the Old Testament Bible stories. And these are well-told stories where they go through the scriptures, and, and, um, but even, even more helpful uh, than the stories is also they are looking at some of the lessons learned. I'm just going to read some of the lessons that were learned uh, about because of um, uh, the things we're reading. One of the lessons, the Lord can lead his people to use a new strategy that has never been used before. When Moses was leader, Joshua fought the Amalekites in the valley where, while Moses observed from a mountain with Aaron and Hur holding up his hands. That's in Exodus 17, 8 through 16. Joshua was a leader in the battle against Jericho. For six days, the Israelites marched around Jericho once each day. On the seventh day, they circled the city seven times, Joshua 6, 1 through 27. But Gideon used a new strategy against the Midianites. What was God's strategy, really? Uh, he had, what, 10,000 men? He ended up with 300. But it was 10,000? It started with 10,000, I think? Yeah. I think it started with 10,000. And the Lord kept saying, no, not, it's too many, too many. And he kept whittling it down. They even had the men, oh, how do you drink water? Do you lap it up like a dog? You know, put your face down on the ground? Or do you take the water to your mouth and look around and see if, see if the enemy is coming? And so he eliminated all those down to 300 people. And if you, if you feared, you know, fighting, you know, send them home. You know, you don't, you don't need more. You know, God can win the battle with a few people, as long as they're courageous. And so he divided 300 men to three companies who went to the edge of the enemy camp, each smashed a jar, held a torch in his left hand, held a trumpet in the right hand, and shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And he defeated them. Amazing. There's so many different ways. God is so creative. Um, <clears throat> Also, uh, one of the lessons, it is often easier to be faithful to God during a crisis time than during prosperity. How about that? Gideon was faithful to God during the crisis of war, but after victory, when he stopped, when he enjoyed prosperity, he was unfaithful. He made an idol and had children with a lot of different women. Yeah. Uh, and so does Solomon, right? Parents should look to, to God for orientation on how to raise her children. Manoah prayed for God to give him and his wife wisdom to raise their son. It should be recommended that every father pray Manoah's prayer. 
Also another, parents can and should dedicate their, child, their ch children to God. However, it's the child who must decide for himself if he will be faithful to God. Manoah and his wife consecrated their child Samson to God from the time he was conceived. As a man, he constantly violated his Nazarite vows in order to satisfy carnal appetites. He used God-given capacities to sa satisfy selfish desires. He was strong as a giant and weak as a child. He fascinated the women. He fascinated the women and was deceived by them. He made trouble for the Philistines. However, he didn't free the Israelites from oppression. He took revenge on an oppressor that he had to live with, and his actions made him a person to be ridiculed. So it's a lot of leadership lessons right here. The strength in one area of life does not make up for our weaknesses. In another area, Samson's physical strength did not make up for his moral weakness. A person who is dedicated to God but seeks sex outside the, of marriage faces ruination. An example is Samson and Deliah. So these are great examples for us. I mean, you may be, there may be these pastors that, that uh, or ministry leaders that decide, oh, I, I'm, I'm very popular and I can, I can stir up a crowd, but you don't know what's happening in their private life. That private life is very important. A woman, now this is, this is very important you know, for women who think they can manipulate men. A woman who uses sex to manipulate men is a curse and not a blessing to those who enjoy her body. The man who allows a woman to manipulate him in order to gain sexual privileges is giving the man the ability to ruin him. So, um, so we have to watch our carnal desires. We have, I mean, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, there's a great book on that. It's called uh, Flame of Yahweh. It's about sexuality as it's um, talked about in the Old Testament. It's not a bad thing, but it can be used against us. And, and you see that, how Balaam did that. <clears throat> um, there's a few more lessons. I think I better move on from this. So, a selfish person who is in spiritual decline may be used by God. However, that person will experience discipline and ruination. Samson is an example. God used Samson to bring temporary benefit to the Israelites. However, Samson didn't use God-given talent for the purpose of helping his people. He only used his force to avenge. He was very much into revenge. His defeat was the result of forgetting to appreciate God's presence, seeking to satisfy personal appetites with pagan girlfriends. Sounds like this world today, right? Uh, practicing sins without feeling remorse nor confessing them, surrendering to an uncontrolled sexual appetite, and constantly violating his Nazarite vows to God. God called Samson to judge Israel and endowed him with spirit power. However, Samson didn't accomplish any permanent benefit for Israel, and he died in captivity, humiliated by the Philistines. But, um, something else about that. It was... You have to look at, well, did he do right in the end? And yes, he did. Um, he was humiliated. His eyes were both uh, taken out, just like, uh, um, was it Manasseh, right? Zedekiah. Oh, Zedek yeah, Zedekiah. And his eyes, his kids were killed and his eyes were poked out in Babylon. And But uh, he actually ends up finishing well. Um, I mean, pretty tough. And in... And Samson is displayed as kind of like a, a trophy of their, conquer, their conquering God. And they, they worshipped um, uh, Dagon. Dagon was a god of worship in, in Gaza. And um, it's a fish god. Okay? And, and that's the same fish god that when they brought the ark into the, the temple of Dagon, uh, the fish god fell over and broke... Um, his arms uh, broke off, and they're like, "Whoa, well, we better go and straighten it out." So they stood up the, stood up the Dagon, and then the next day it fell off and it fell prostrate before the ark, and its head was off and the arms. It was all broken apart, and so 
they they worshipped Dagon. And so there were there's a temple there to Dagon, and all the priests and all the leaders, three I think it was three thousand. See, I'm looking at Elizabeth because she knows these numbers as well. Um, um, about 3,000 uh, leaders were in that temple. And so in one fell swoop, he, um, and he, of course, he was blind, and so they're like making him perform pretty humiliating time. And, uh, but he asked God, you know, for one last uh, push of strength. And his hair had grown back after he got up, he was in prison. And so his power come back, and um, and so his one last act is really an act of redemption. And in one fell swoop, he takes out the leadership of an entire nation, essentially, and all the priests, and they were all corrupt. And so, so that was a pretty interesting end for him. But you might look at there's a lot of leadership lessons there. Okay, well, moving right along. Um, I'd like to look at um, Treasury of David by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Psalm 22. And this psalm refers to Christ containing much that cannot be applied to any other. You know, like parting his garments at the cross, casting lots for his clothing as the, as the uh, soldiers did. It's really called, it's about the suffering, praise, and posterity of the Messiah. It's a psalm of the cross. To the chief musician is set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. And Spurgeon, in speaking of the psalm, said, we should reverently read the psalm, putting off our shoes from our, for our, from our feet, as Moses did at the burning bush. If there be holy ground anywhere in Scripture, it is in this psalm. The words of Christ on the cross of Calvary, it may uh, been, it may have been actually repeated word for word by our Lord when hanging on the tree. It would be too bold to say that it was, but even a casual reader may see that it may have been. It begins with and ends, according to some in the original, with, it is finished. And it starts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and the night season, and am not silent. Now, I think it's a really, we're coming into a very important uh, lesson here. For our, this is um, by uh, Spurgeon, and he says, for our prayers to appear, for our prayers to appear to be unheard is no new trial. Jesus felt it before us, and it is observable that he still held fast his believing hold on God and cried still, My God. On the other hand, his faith did not, did not render him less importunate. That's a, a word meaning being troubles, troublesomely urgent, overly persistent in requests or demand like your creditors, you know. I want that money now. You got to pay that rent now, or you know, it's like you know, you're going to get thrown on the street. Well, that's like that kind of prayer. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that our Lord continued to pray even though no comfortable answer came, and in this He set us an example of obedience to His own words. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. No daylight is too glaring, and no midnight too dark to pray in, and no delay or apparent denial however grievous, should tempt us to forbear from that kind of pleading prayer. We have to plead. But you are holy and enthroned, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, he trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Timothy Rogers commented on this in Spurgeon's Treasury of David. Oh, how will our very hearts melt with love when we remember that as we have been distressed for our sins against him, so he was in greater agony for us. He was under the violent pain in the garden and on the cross. 
He was bleeding. He was sweating blood. I had some nosebleeds this week, uh, four of them, and it just all of a sudden happened. And, um, you know, I think about, you know, him on the cross, and we pray, please, you know, Lord, heal these things. Sometimes, you know, he doesn't do things. I mean, this is like Jesus in the garden. You felt, you know, sorrowful and you're forsaken, deserted by your disciples, affronted and reproached by his enemies. And under a curse for us, this son was under a doleful eclipse. You know, um, the living Lord was pleased to die and his death was under the frowns of an angry God. But God is there. And that's, that's his, his example to us that even when he's going through this great trial, he knows that God is good and he will answer our prayers. You know, um, he's talking about the sun was under a doleful eclipse, uh, referring to Jesus. And um, I, I like to sometimes sit out in the morning when I can in the morning sun and just have a glass of water or something. And, and uh, um, one morning I was sitting outside and I was cold. That's why I like to warm up in the morning. And so I'm sitting out in the sun, and um, it just feels so cold. I, I, didn't, I couldn't get warm. And then my daughter, um, my youngest daughter, she said, when I came in, she said, Oh, Dad, there's an eclipse. Didn't you know there's an eclipse? When the sun is eclipsed by the moon, it's very cold. And so sometimes, you know, these eclipses come, and, you know, we're... We're not we're not warm by the sun, so there's periods of time. But you are but you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. And this is the just thinking about him, Jesus being on the cross. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan. These are, these are not actual bulls. These are people encircling him. And they gape at me with their mouths like raging and roar, a roaring lion. And he's poured out like water. He's been crucified. It's the most terrible, terrible thing that happens. The ter most terrible um, punishment. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me, and the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. These are prophecies, okay? This is what, 200 years or more before? Oh, more, more. 700? Something like that. I think... It's it's a long time before the actual crucifixion. They didn't even know about crucifixion. So they pierced my hands and my feet. Okay, well, Jesus, they pierced his hands and his feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me because you're being lifted up. They divide my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. And lots was a, a game they would play with dice and so these these soldiers are just around and they looking at his his robe because they put a robe on him was a very nice piece of cloth the royal cloth and so they're casting lots for it but you O lord did not do not be far from me O my strength hasten to help me deliver me from the sword my precious life from the power of the dog save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen you have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise him, praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. 
For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. This he has done. He has th- that he has done this. So it's really a great psalm. It's a lot of prophecies, a lot of encouragement. Um, okay, so we're now going to... About, it was about a thousand years before the crucifixion. Wow. Um, there's a, some resources. Um, I'm going to also look at a longer thing um, and get to it. Um, it's almost seven. It's almost seven, okay. Um, the Mayflower. Um, Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford. And the Plymouth Plantation, uh, I read um, three segments of this book on the, excuse me. (laughs) On the Plymouth Plantation. It was edited by Benjamin Franklin. I mean, after it was written, of course. And uh, Bradford originally hailed from Yorkshire in northern England before moving to um, Holland in order to escape religious persecution by King James I of England for his Puritan separatist beliefs. He immigrated to the Plymouth colony on the Mayflower in 1620. He is a signatory on the Mayflower Compact. Excuse me. Itch. Um, very dry. Um, a lot of the the Santa Ana winds are very dry, dry you out. He's a signatory to the Mayflower Compact. Why am I talking about this? November eleventh is is the anniversary of the the Mayflower. Okay, and they're signing the the uh, the Mayflower Compact, and um, it's really important. Um, and when back in 2020, when a lot of things were going on, 2019, the New York Times declared that the arrival of the captives in Virginia was the true beginning of America, an America that had the Times characterized as slave slaveocracy. Um, and this is before. 1776. The Times calls this campaign to promote this story, the 1619 Project. And this uh, man that wrote this book, he said, in my new book, 1620, I argue that the arrival of the pilgrims, along with dozens of non-pilgrims, strangers, as the pilgrims called them, aboard the Mayflower, is a real beginning of America. And when you read that story, I, I read it. Um, I read it, so you'll you'll see the the link on Exploring God's Library Facebook page, so you can listen to all three. It's a very interesting story. Um, from those hundred pilgrims that landed on our shores, uh, about half of them survived the winter. But from that half that survived, there are now 35 million people in America that can trace their roots to the um, to the landing on the Mayflower. Yeah, and... Uh, I found out this year, Elizabeth just reminded me, thanks to um, a friend, um, Minor Perkins, and this wasn't, I, I didn't ask for this. And I don't know how he got this, but he, he was doing research on me, and I'm a descendant of William Bradford, of the Mayflower, which is kind of neat. Um, and so um, they signed this compact, and in that com- Mayflower compact, they set aside their deep divisions and voluntarily joined together to govern themselves with just and equal laws. This was the very beginning of principled self-government among European settlers in the New World. The Mayflower Compact is not quite 200, 200 words long, but those words pack almost as much meaning as Thomas Jefferson distilled into the Declaration of Independence 156 years later, or Abraham Lincoln in 1863 condensed into the Gettysburg Address. I'm just going to read it. In 
In the name of God, amen. We who, this is when they're on the Mayflower, before they got off, they agreed to these things. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together in a, into a civil body politic for better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have hereafter subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th November, November uh, New Style, November 21, in the year of the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, the Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domino, 1620, the year of our Lord. It was John Carver, William Brewster, William Bradford, Winslow, Miles Standish, and so pretty powerful thing. Another thing um, that uh, we did post uh, is a resource um, we came across from LibriVox. Um, it's the a lot of things are are they're they're out of print or they're they're co they're no longer under copyright, and so people will volunteer to read uh, segments of books, etc. And there's one by Flavius Josephus, who was born in 37 or 38 A.D., who is a learned historian in Israel who investigated all the major Jewish sects with a view to committing himself to the one which best exemplified his concepts of piety. He thoroughly studied the philosophies of the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and at the age of 19, Josephus became a Pharisee. And uh, so he's, uh, this LibriVox recording of, is of the antiquities of the Jews, I think you'll find it interesting. It's a resource. And so if you're, you don't have access to uh, this volume of the books, you can ac ac access it there and they can even read it to you. So Josephus, at the age of 26, was thrust into prominence when he journeyed to Rome to be the champion of some of his fellow priests that were uh, arrested by Rome. And also under that, I have a... Um, uh, and there's another thing I, I mentioned... Uh, I found uh, you, you, you recognize that we use Proverbs, uh, Charles Bridges' commentary on Proverbs a lot, and it's just so full of wisdom, biblical wisdom. And uh, I discovered a digital, uh, a digital a site that has Charles Bridges' uh, text, and so you can go right into the text and you know, read uh, the the commentary and, and the scriptures right there. So if you don't have access to Proverbs uh, that, that's written or can't afford it, you can use it, use a digital copy. It's very helpful. Okay, so uh, that's um, about all I can do tonight, I believe. I am um, Matthew. Matthew is just. I hope you're reading your scriptures because you're in Matthew now and you're in the triumphal entry. And you've gone through a lot of the parables, a lot of the healings, and uh, it's just such a rich book. Um, I've been reading a book called The Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus New Light on the Seed of Moses from Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew by Nehemiah Gordon. It's really a crash, he gives a crash course in the Pharisees and the two Torahs by, by he's, he's a Hebrew scripturalist, which means he's kind of like a, a Old Testament Jewish John MacArthur, okay? He's, he just holds the Old Testament um, scripture. 
Um, I, I'm at, at the top of the hour, and I have so much to talk about because I spent a long time uh, writing some things, actually about 20 pages, uh, 20 pages, which I might do on just a separate, uh, a separate broadcast because it is such a powerful lesson, and I alluded to it several times, so I don't want to rob anybody, but um, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> so um, thank you for uh, joining us tonight, and, um, and keep reading the Word. You know, it's the most important appointment that we have each day, and uh, before you pick up that cell phone or check your Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever you're on, um, I recommend you pray first and then you read the scriptures. And in Exploring God's Library face, private Facebook page, which is free, and you can get in there pretty easily, you know, um, there is a place where you can download the reading calendar for the year, for 23 to 24. And um, and something Elizabeth worked, Elizabeth and I worked very hard on, and it's very helpful. So it keeps you going through the scriptures, and and um, and so it's going to be very helpful. So so don't uh, don't don't miss your reading. The reading is so important, and you'll you'll not regret it. Uh, and if it's your first appointment of the day, I remember um, an old missionary used to was staying with us uh, after she had injured herself. And uh, Andy Beth Brunemeyer, and Beth was a missionary in Nepal, grew up as a missionary kid in China, and um, worked with Tibetan refugees as well. And um, and she would excuse herself each night pretty early, about nine or so. She's saying, "I've got a very important appointment in the morning." Well, that was her appointment with the Lord. And truly, more and more, the longer we live, that's. I see that that is the most important appointment we have of the day. And it shouldn't be interrupted. The Holy Spirit is teaching us through His Word. God is teaching us. The Son of God is interceding for us. And I tell you, it's, it's, a man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I encourage you to read. Be diligent in your reading. And, um, and invite people to, to accompany you on the journey. All right. Well, God bless you. Um, may the Lord be with you, guide you and protect you, provide for all your needs. And I pray that you're, you're all well and, um, and, and drawing close to the Lord. Have a, a, great, um, a great week. And also, do listen to those, those things. There, oh, there's another one, too. It's on Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Ron, Ron Wyatt, uh, who was a amateur archaeologist, but he, he was better than a lot of archaeologists, uh, uh, discovered the things at the, uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah and talks about that. And it's an excellent, excellent video on that. And, um, and so you've got lots of homework. You can do as much as you like, but the reading is the most important. All right. Well, God bless, and um, may the Lord be with you. Good night.